Hello and welcome to this live and informal panel. It's a choices panel for the Department of English at JMU, and it is open to anyone who has an interest in English, anyone who wants to get a sense of what it's like to um, be on campus at JMU um, or to be in the English department. And we've got a lovely panel of faculty members and students here, current students who are all happy to talk about um, our experiences. I'll just say a little bit of information about the department before we get going on introductions. Um, the first is that the English department is part of the College of Arts and Letters at JMU. And most of, I think all of those departments are located around the kind of big um, old bluestone quad. Uh, the earliest of those buildings uh, are from 1908 when this was Madison College. Um, so it has a kind of old university feel. And the English department is in Kiesel Hall, which is very near uh, D Hall, the dining hall that's on the kind of northwest side of campus. It is also near Carrier Library and the all important coffee shop that's located inside. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we have about 30 faculty members um, and a num we have an English major and a number of minors that are housed in our department, including an English minor, of course, uh, and a creative writing minor and some other concentrations. So lots going on in terms of academics. And I'd now like to start uh, with our panel introductions so we can talk about who's here with us today. Can we start with um, Professor Fagan? Sure, um, I'm Allison Fagan. I um, obviously am in the English department. I'm an associate professor. Um, I research and teach contemporary American literature um, with an emphasis on uh, African-American and uh, Latinx literatures. Um, what else shall I say? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here and um, I'm originally from Chicago, um, but coming to the Shenandoah Valley has been, um, I think, one of the best decisions of my life. So <laughs> I'll share that as well. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wren. Hi everyone, I'm Professor Greg Wren. Um, I obviously am also um, a professor in the English department. I'm an assistant professor. Um, I teach mainly um, creative writing. So I am a poet. I'm an actively publishing poet and a nonfiction writer. Um, I'm currently working on a second collection of poems uh, as well as a memoir uh, about using, uh, using nature to, um, using nature as a mental health resource. That's what I'm writing about. And so I teach courses um, like I teach poetry workshops and I teach um, intro and advanced poetry workshops. I teach uh, a course, a very exciting course called the Environmental Imagination. And it's, a, it's an environmental writing course. And um, I have my students go out into the, um, into the wilderness where we are sandwiched between uh, Shenandoah National Park and George Washington National Forest. So JMU is an incredible spot to be in to study um, anything involving the environment. Um, and so uh, I teach that environmental imagination course. And then I teach a couple of large, larger literature courses, one on lyric poetry, and then another one um, called Environmental Literature of Wonder and Crisis. So this is an incredible university. And um, I just want to just issue or, or offer a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you. Wonderful. Professor Lowe? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Lowe, Professor Lowe, um, and I come to you guys from Los Angeles originally where I earned my doctorate in cinema studies at UCLA and uh, like everybody else I have really enjoyed this move over to the Shenandoah Valley and teaching at JMU uh, where I focus on film and media studies in the English department. Uh, my specialization is in the aesthetics and the politics of East Asian, specifically Chinese language art cinemas. And a lot of that research I started doing back in my uh, doctoral research days at UCLA. Um, and a book is out based on that research now, which is called The Authorship of Place. Um, and it takes methods and schools of thinking from cultural geography, as well as anthropology, uh, to study how filmmakers interact with local community members while shooting not documentary, but fictional films. So you can imagine all the interesting sort of imaginative work and labor that goes into the production of those uh, media artifacts. Um, some of the future research I'm really into these days is about 
uh, the intersection of new medias like virtual reality and augmented reality and how it informs our perception of spaces and places. Um, so that is actually a topic I'm actively investigating with some of my graduate students and my 300 level students in some of these special topics courses that I teach related to film and media. Um, but more broadly, I teach the um, kind of the gateway major requirement class, Intro to Film, which is offered to both English and SMAD students at JMU. Um, and I also teach a large general education section called Ideology and Global Cinemas, uh, which explores how ideologies are reflected in films, but also perpetuated and propagated through films all the way from the pre-war Japanese era to the present day with transnational Mexican and Hollywood co-productions. Um, I have also taught both 400 and 300 level versions of film and media theory, where we talk about just how the nature of reality and how we perceive it changes as we look at it through the lens of cinema all the way to other screen-based technologies like virtual reality. Um, some of my uh, most favorite classes to teach, all these are favorite classes of mine to teach, but some of the really innovative ones, in my opinion, where students get to do a lot of hands-on work, just like Professor Wren and um, Professor Fagan talked about, are my Eco Cinemas class, where we actually have students break up into different documentary teams and learn the basics of documentary production and go and do their own original research on environmental issues in the region and produce their own original works based on that. And in fact, uh, Ellis over here was one of the uh, star students of that class and they produced some really excellent work coming out of that class. Um, obviously, I'm not the only professor in the English department who teaches film. We have uh, Drs. Goffrin and Hefner and Godfrey as well. They focus on American cinema, African-American cinema. You know, We study cinema from all sorts of different angles and perspectives. Uh, final thing I'd like to point your attention to, I'll be brief about this because we can probably address it further during the Q&A, uh, is the film studies minor. Uh, the film studies minor is a joint uh, kind of cross-disciplinary minor offered both by English and SMAD. And um, it really is a wonderful little minor because it blends theory and production in a really balanced, really elegant manner. Uh, and it reminds me even of my days back, back at UCLA studying film in the film school there. Um, as a film studies minor, you'll have a variety of different kinds of film classes to choose from, from a literary and also from a mass comm perspective. Um, and students have gone off to just amazing careers in academic studies of film and media, literature, um, but also in screenwriting, in documentary production, you know, you name it. Um, so there's just so much variety being offered in our department here. And I really hope you guys will take in advantage of this. And um, I guess I would just want to leave you guys with this thought that um, over here in the English department, we're here because we love to teach. And a lot of our research is actually informed by and comes out of that real life laboratory that is the classroom. And so we would love to have you here and be, you know, part of our experience of, you know, doing good scholarship and learning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hear from Ellis. Hello, uh, my name is Ellis Finney. I'm a senior English major, uh, film nerd, uh, and I'm a creative <laughs> writing minor. So. Great. Thanks, Ellis. Emily. Hi, um, I'm also a senior English major. I have a double major in political science, um, and I'm looking forward to discussing with you guys right now. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, I think I failed to say that my name is Sean White. I'm a professor in the English department also, uh, and I specialize in uh, literatures from the first half of the 20th century, specifically from Britain and Ireland. So I spend a lot of time talking about Irish history and World War One and two and the rise of feminism and interesting, weird, confusing forms, novel forms. Um, so that's my area of focus. Uh, lately, though, I've also been teaching in contemporary Irish literature because there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in uh, Northern Ireland starting in about the 1960s. So good stuff. Um, great, gang. Thank you. So I thought we might start out by talking a bit about uh, the experience of um, being in classes, uh, interesting assignments, stuff that's really about the sort of 
um, academic experience in the English department. And I'm gonna go ahead and open this up to everyone um, to kind of dive in as they feel like they wanna answer. Um, so my first um, question would go to both faculty and students, and it would be, um, what are classes like? <laughs> um, what kind of expectations uh, do students experience from classes? Maybe faculty, faculty could share what expectations they bring um, for the students. So anyone who'd like to start us off. I can go first. Um, so as a student, I have changed my major like five times, um, and that is not an over-exaggeration. <laughs> um, I came to the English major in like a very roundabout way. Um, I thought it was super narrow and then I discovered how broad it was and that's what I really liked about it. Um, but in classes, I've had professors that will like create unnecessary, con like in other majors, I wanna point that out, um, that like create unnecessary competition. And I really liked the environment in every single English class. Like it's always felt like very collaborative and not competitive. And like, you can just say something and like, no one will like everyone builds off of it rather than like trying to knock you down or being like on the other hand or like just to play devil's advocate like i just love the environment in all english classes and like i generally come away very like with a smile at the end um so that's my experience as a student and i'm gonna uh kind of piggyback off emily there where uh, i feel like especially in the english department from what i've seen um especially within class uh, all of the professors here do an amazing job of creating a sense of community within the students, you know, uh, like pretty quickly students like, um, hey, we need to make a group me, set up some study sessions, things like that. So uh, that's one of the things that I've come to really enjoy. Anyone else want to chime in? Well, I think to... Um... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, to echo Emily's and Ellis's points, I would uh, say that really the expectation that I have of students coming into my classes, anything from a 200 level to a grad level class is really just that thirst, right, for um, intellectual sort of knowledge and critical thinking and for also that thirst for wanting to share their experiences, their prior knowledge and their process of learning with their classmates. And so, for instance, as an example, the film studies minor, many of the more advanced classes don't actually have prerequisites, right, in any form of film technique or film studies classes. You just go in and with an attitude of being open to learning, you know, everything, right, the basics to the advanced materials. And if you're willing to share your understanding, maybe you're better with production, right? But you're not so good at understanding the themes of a film. So then as that student, you might go to somebody else who's taken a couple of literature classes and you work with them to better understand how to do a close reading, right, of the themes. And at the same time, you can teach them how to look at films from a production angle. So it's extremely collaborative. I want my students to feel engaged in the community. I was just gonna add as well that I think if anything, an expectation that I have um, from my students, it's not necessarily one that I have from them at the beginning, but I am hopeful that <laughs> we will have accomplished by the end, which is that this matters, mm -hmm. um, that what we do matters. Um, and not only in terms of thinking about analyzing literature and sharpening your critical thinking and writing skills, um, but also that storytelling and um, questions of who is able to tell stories and, and who is prevented from telling stories. Those are questions that matter in the world. Um, and, and we take them seriously. And, um, and there's a lot of joy in that and there's a lot of frustration, um, but there's always a sense that, that what we do is important. I think sometimes that gets lost. Um, if anyone out there has been told, maybe don't major in English um, <laughs> um, because they're afraid that it doesn't have real world applications or, or something mm -hmm. like that. This matters. It really does um, in terms of your, your sense of yourself and your sense of the world. I don't think there's anything better than an English major for preparing you for entering that world. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where I hope we get to by the end of the semester. Sometimes we don't quite get there, but, <laughs> but it's the goal. <laughs> I would say for myself that yeah, I teach um, mainly in the creative writing minor, 
Um, so it's, it's a little bit different than some of the literature classes. Um, and yet it's quite similar because I think that both literature and creative writing, the end game is yes, for it to matter. And if it's gonna matter, it means that there's some kind of community that has been, that has, that is, that has formed. There have been connections that have been made. And of course, as we study literature, the main, you know, the, the, the main connection is between reader and writer, right? And, and so you, you, can get, you can get to know Walt Whitman, even though he's long gone, you can get to know Walt Whitman. You can get to know Emily Dickinson. You can, you can have a conversation, um, you know, through time. And it, it really matters um, to go beyond what you think is possible and what you think is true and to expand that definition. And so, you know, like I always tell my creative writing students, you know, great readers make good, great, great readers make great writers. So, you know, I think that, that those of you who love to read, those of you who love to um, think critically, um, those of you who want to develop empathy, you can do that. Um, the expectation is that you do that on the, you know, with on the page. You do that with the authors that you read. You do that with, um, but you also do that with at least in, in the in the writing workshops. You're doing that with the other students in the room. You're developing those connections. You're you're um, you're understanding one another and 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 being enriched in the process. So I think my expectation would be um, openness, you know. Openness, but not a kind of woo-woo openness. <laughs> not a woo-woo openness. Not a, you know, not a fair, not something like that. It's more, it's a bold risk-taking openness that you risk being changed. You risk being transformed. And so the expectation is that you keep an open mind. And the expectation is that you show up, not only to class, <laughs> <laughs> but to the page and 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 to to your to your writing desk you know to, to show up and to build those connections so um so i yeah i always say uh, being openness and and a uh, and openness to the mystery of language and life um and and uh and and follow through you know so hmm. you know it i was thinking about um a couple of semesters ago I had a student who was in a general education class of mine, uh, and those can often be larger classes than the rest of the classes in our department. Uh, and she really liked what we were doing in the class, um, and she wanted to maybe take the class that I was teaching in the spring, which was going to be much smaller, and in fact ended up being nine, nine people. Um, but she came up to me after that semester and said, uh, I really want to take this class, but I don't think I know enough about the, um, the authors and the history to take it. And I was like, no, <laughs> you don't have to know anything about, well, you know, that's the thing is we're going to get together and we're going to learn all the back stuff and we're going to learn about the terms and the people and the events that come up on the page. We're going to do that, that together. Um, the point is to come in with no prior knowledge necessarily uh, and to build those skills and to build that knowledge. And so I'd say that to anyone who's considering taking uh, an English class or, or joining the major that, um, you don't have to have prior knowledge. You don't have to import any kind of specific thing. Come in with an, an openness, as, as Professor Wren has said, um, an openness to seeing what's in uh, the semester. And uh, we're really excited to build out all that background um, around any of the, the literary works that we're talking about or the cinematic works that we're talking about. Um, I, I thought I might ask if, um, if anyone would like to talk, and I'm thinking specifically about um, Ellis and Emily possibly, but um, anyone can talk about a specific assignment or project um, uh, or a talk that they went to, some, something specific that they can talk about uh, that was really interesting or surprising or that re went really well. Anyone have anything in their pocket? Ellis, yeah. Um, Dr. Lowe mentioned this earlier, but um, in his Eco Cinemas class, uh, we had to make a short film and um, I'm a self-professed film nerd. So as soon as I found that out, I was like, yeah, I think this might be the class for me. <laughs> and um, 
it was so interesting to see how my learning of film along with like Dr. Lowe's lectures and screenings and uh, making one kind of shifted uh, certain perceptions I had. Uh, it's hard to explain, but uh, I think the way Dr. Lowe had, I want to say, set up his class, uh, my, <laughs> my creative brain and my, uh, I want to say analytical brain just started working differently in a much better way, I would say. So um, that assignment was uh, much more than simply like making a film. You know, I was uh, changed <laughs> by the time I had come out of it, like emotionally and intellectually. So uh, I love that, love that assignment, love that class. So. That sounds so fun. I wish I had taken it. Um, <laughs> I'm hearing a fifth year coming. Um, but why can I talk about a project? Um, Dr. Fagan knows. Um, so I took uh, English 360, which is ethnic American literature. Um, and we did this cool project um, called Harrisonburg 360, where we went out in the community, interviewed immigrants and made a podcast. Um, I actually loved it so much that now I'm TAing the class this semester. Um, and I love working with the group. I just think the way the class was structured, like moving from literature to like real life community-based experiences, like made me grow like in my contextual understanding of English and like relating it to my life. Um, I actually had so much fun with that. Like, I love it. I still plug it. I made my mom listen to it in the car. Um, <laughs> And that project, seriously, um, it really combined like a lot of my interests too. And so, as I said earlier, I'm a political science major. And like, if I've ever had a class with you, you know, I'm always looking for like the connections between like how literature is informed by politics. Um, and I think like in that project, we got so much of that, um, especially like internationally and domestically. Um, so I love that. Um, we'll plug it till the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're getting ready for season two, as Emily said. So my mom's gonna listen to that so hard. <laughs> um, well, I guess I might um, segue from that to think about. I mean, we've talked about podcasts and we've talked about um, film production, the actual kind of production of the the cultural documents that we study in English, as opposed to just reading the ones um, that that come to us uh, historically or from outside. We've talked about creative writing, we've talked about podcasts, we've talked about films. So I wanted to know everyone's um, interest or experience in um, the kind of technologies of the classroom. I mean, we've got the book. You can see a lot of us have books in the background. Uh, that was <laughs> one of the first technologies that we had, but um, I mean, this is the 21st century. So would anyone like to talk about their experience with technologies um, in or around the classroom? I'd be happy to start us off. Great. Um, so inside the classroom, I think in terms of the most important technology you have over there, it's, um, I like to think about technology as a medium for communicating ideas, right? And as Marshall McLuhan has pointed out, the medium is the message, sometimes at least. And um, what that means is the way we think the way we structure our knowledge, the way we relate to others, the way our perceptions are formed is actually impacted by the technologies we surround ourselves by. And so if you look at my home office over here, right, but my, uh, my office at school also has similar bookshelves, <laughs> you have a variety of different kinds of visual mediums, right? And one of the things that you can see is that there's a lot of framing going on. There's the picture frames, there's the frames around the bookshelves. There's the frames on the, uh, the window drapes as well, too. And in my class, we talk about how different kinds of technologies frame our perception of reality and how what we are used to believing, used to seeing, used to communicating cannot be taken for granted. But instead, it is deeply impacted by the technologies and frames that we use to envision the world around us. And so I think that's my launching point into using technology is to use it knowing that it actually changes the way we behave and think. And then from that launching point, I get people to experiment with all sorts of different mediums, right? Written mediums, visual mediums, screen-based mediums, even virtual mediums. And right now, this format, for instance, um, you know, recording this uh, through Zoom 
that's a kind of virtual medium that creates an interesting and otherwise different dynamic from what we might have in person. And I teach students to not only be able to recognize that and to identify that, but to also be able to master what is unique about each of the mediums, right? In more effectively communicating their ideas and what have you. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess I, I just like to stop here. You know, I can get into the specific details of every medium, but uh, <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> Well, um, I can add to that. Um, so I teach a class, uh, it's a, a 400 level, which means it's an upper level advanced seminar uh, in race and publishing. Um, and in that class, um, to kind of echo uh, what Professor White was talking about with the book as technology, but also to think about all of the, the whole publishing world. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in that class is um, that technology is always political, right? Mm-hmm. And that the technology of the book is political. Who's printing things? Who's editing things? Who's choosing the cover design? Um, and, and how in our analysis of, say for example, the patterns we can find in the, the color choices that are used in book covers to represent uh, black writers or Asian writers, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the our African books get what's called the acacia tree sunset treatment, which is that every <laughs> book has a sunset and maybe a giraffe. Um, and uh, so there's that kind of um, politicizing of technology. But we also talk about how um, folks who are often marginalized writers uh, or people who want to be writers make use of technology in surprising ways to kind of subvert people who, who, who might not think their voices are, are worth hearing. Um, social media is a really great example of that. We study in that same class, the We Need Diverse Books campaign, which started as a Twitter hashtag and is now a full nonprofit um, that, that works with K-12 educators to get them uh, books by marginalized writer featuring main characters, protagonists of color. Um, so thinking about marshalling social media and those kinds of technology in the service of, again, storytelling from, from folks who, who often are sidelined by, by mainstream publishing houses. Um, that's all, that's all kind of, it's all political, um, but it's all uh, an opportunity to see just how creative and ingenious people can be. <laughs> Um, so that's that's something that I think comes out in a lot of classes as well, this attention to not only what's the book about, but how did it get here? And I don't think my class is alone in, in, in kind of talking through those things. We're always kind of thinking about where did this book come from? Why this book and why not another book? And those questions I think are really fascinating and, and provocative, so. Mm-hmm. In the environmental uh, literature and writing classes that I teach, um, we talk a lot about technology. We talk a lot about how technology um, can both, I guess, in a sense, bring us, bring us lots of, you know, it can bring us lots of information. It can, um, it can help solve environmental problems or, or manage them. Um, Lots of drones on the Serengeti, you know, <laughs> tracking rhinos and giraffes um, and acacia trees. Um, so, but then we, of course, also talk about how technology is deadening our senses. And so, one of the things that I ask, well, the, the first assignment in my environmental imagination course is for the students to go into the national forest or into the national park and where there is no signal, there is no phone signal. And I asked them to practice deep looking. So they have to choose a, a creature or landscape feature, or perhaps the creature or landscape feature chooses them. <laughs> they, they, learn, they learn that. Um, but, uh, and they are required to, you know, uh, write in their, in their notebooks for an extended period of time noticing as much as they can about this creature or landscape feature. And then um, they, they, write, they write an essay about this experience of deep looking with, you know, with no, you know, there's no one to text. There's, 
there's there's really the only technology is their pen and um and and the notebook and then and then i have them use this experience of deep looking to um kind of ground discussion a philosophical discussion so so you looked at the mushroom for 30 minutes you looked at the mountain for an hour you looked at the frozen waterfall for 45 minutes what did that mean to you you know why did it matter what, what why, why did it matter and um and many times students will talk about this this assignment as being really eye opening, um, because they they see they see that once that they once they are able to turn off some of these devices and leave society, they actually can practice uh, a level of attunement and mindfulness that they didn't think was even possible. And then they begin to understand some of these canonical environmental writers like Thoreau and Emerson. They, they, you know, they, they might think of them before as being quite dry, but then once they kind of go to their Walden Pond themselves <laughs> and, and practice deep looking, then they, then they actually begin to understand, you know, they begin to understand the the, the whole um, the whole enterprise of of environmental writing. So um, so yes, technology. <laughs> you know, uh, the idea of going physically to another place, going into the community to make a podcast, going into the mountains, um, makes me think about. Uh, when I teach our introduction to writing course, I have an opportunity uh, to pick any literary or cinematic text I want. I can I get to teach you know Shakespeare, which I usually wouldn't. Um, and we have this theater that's like 25 um, miles from where we live, and it's it's modeled. It's called the Blackfriars Theater, and it's modeled on Shakespeare's original Blackfriars Theater. And the reason this came to mind is because, well, for one thing, it means leaving campus and going out and uh, looking at uh, texts as they are performed, right? It's a stage, uh, but also because um, they have set it up with the same technological limitations that Shakespeare himself had, which was they didn't have spotlights. Um, they, they just have on house lights as they would have with a, a theater with the kind of open ceiling where the sun comes in, or if it's at night, it doesn't come in and it, they've got candles. Um, and I, I usually ask students um, to uh, obviously, we read the play as a text, whatever the, the play happens to be. Um, it's I've taught The Tempest, and I've taught Othello, and um, I've taught Romeo and Juliet, which everyone has read, I think, probably in the universe. Um, but to think about um, what does the text look like on the page? What are the words that were chosen? What are the stage directions? Ah, but then to see it come alive when you have actual bodies moving around um, and all the interpretive possibilities um, of, for blocking how the costumes look, where people are in relation to each other. Um, and thinking about um, the audience's ability or inability to see things clearly, or uh, it's, a, it's a stage that is kind of three quarters round. Um, and so if you're sitting way over here next to the near backstage, you're getting a different perspective. And that theater company embraces those kind of limitations of the technology and make it part of the experience of that play. And then of course, I, I invite students to write about the various different interpretations of the play, whether it's text or performance. Um, and that's of course, another bonus opportunity that's in the Shenandoah Valley, which is that we have the Blackfriars <laughs> Shakespeare Company Theater. Um, so that just came to mind. I wondered if anyone would like then to maybe talk about, I mean, we've heard about the Shenandoah National Parks, which are nearby, but uh, would anyone be interested in sharing their experience of um, living in the area? I'm sure there are um, prospective students who would like to know from Emily and Ellis what it's like maybe living on campus and then moving off of campus or eating pizza. I don't know. Um, so if anyone would like to talk about their experience with the area. Well, like uh, my first two years here, I lived on campus um, and I would characterize that as like this theme of community keeps coming up, but um, really trying like finding my place within, like not only within like Harrison, Bird and JMU, but just uh, where I want to study, things like that. 
And then um, my last two years here, which I finally moved off campus, and uh, I finally found my place within, like, when I'm going to study and things like that, uh, it's become more grounded in a way. Um, I know this is, I feel like I'm speaking too metaphorical, but um, it has become, a, I would say, as finding your roots in my last two years here has been, like, uh, really nurturing, I would say. Um, I would say uh, even the, I feel like a fanboy of you all, but like I really cannot reiterate this enough how good the faculty is here. So um, yeah, that was a bit of a ramble and I'm sorry. But. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so that was beautiful, Ellis. I don't know how I can follow that one up, um, but I also lived on campus for two years. Um, and I think when you live on campus, the JMU the Jamie bubble is more pronounced. It's so, like, I really enjoyed living off campus and like going out into the community and like becoming a regular at Viatopia. <laughs> and um, I love Harrisonburg. I love like, sometimes I go drive around and look at houses. That's like a weird hobby. Um, I just see what houses are nice. Um, like getting that experience and like becoming connected with community members in Harrisonburg has been so amazing and so enriching. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't really like Harrisonburg um, freshman year, um, but it's really grown on me since then. And like, I'm so sad that I have to leave. Um, this whole conversation is making me think fifth year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Emily, you've got those law school applications in, so it might be. I don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, your letter is in. <laughs> I need to. <laughs> Um, I'm from Southern California, and then I have a whole bunch of family in Colorado. So we are um, hiking outdoorsy type people. Uh, and I, uh, I, I mean, this area is wonderful for that. Um, this part of Virginia, whether you're inside the valley or on the east side of the mountain, um, oh my, it's just beautiful. It's really beautiful. It does have four seasons. And I know that's important to a lot of folks who have maybe grown up with four seasons. So the leaves fall, they, they turn different colors and so forth. Um, but it's also not um, <laughs> super gray and not, I mean, it's, it's kind of this perfect melding of, oh, I'm having seasons, but also it's going to be 61 and everything will melt today and how pleasant that is. Um, so the mountain biking opportunities, the hiking opportunities, the canoeing, I've never been canoeing before, um, kayaking, walking around. I live very, very close to campus, which I love. It's a, it's a pretty walkable city, which is nice. Um, so I don't know, it, just to give a sense of what, what campus is like, it's, um, it's, it can be a quite beautiful place. I would also like to jump in and say that I am from the middle of nowhere. Um, and so I love the city environment of Harrisonburg. Like I love being in a city. I love that I can get somewhere within 10 minutes, um, but I also love walking. Um, so I love that I can walk <coughs> to my apartment um, and like take a nice stroll on the quad. Like even if I don't have any in-person classes, like I will still come and just walk around campus because it's that pretty. I feel like there's always someone with like a really cute puppy on the quad. Isn't there always some sort of off-leash adorable dog? It's great. They usually show up in the Zoom videos too. Also, uh, oh, um, sorry, Alice. Go no, no, I, I should mention that Kleins has the best milkshakes. If you're in the milkshakes, uh, I, I couldn't leave an opportunity to plug Kleins. So Kleins has really good milkshakes. So, uh, that's not that far away from campus if I don't, if I remember correctly, so yeah. <laughs> Kleins is a local dairy, it's a local family, and they have actually two locations in Harrisonburg. So if you don't like the flavor at the North Kleins, you can go to the West <laughs> South Kleins and then they always have, I'm a peppermint shake gal kind of myself, I don't know about you, but. Thank you for plugging Clint. I hadn't even really thought of it, but it seems crucial now. <laughs> I'm a black raspberry <laughs> type of person. <laughs> That's my jam. But I, I love Harrisonburg's diversity. You know, you think, you know, one might think that this sort of mountain town would be, you know, there wouldn't be much diversity, but there's a lot of diversity. 
I think it's been said there are 70, 60 or 70 different foreign languages spoken in the local high school. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of diversity. And, um, and I think that what, we're, what we try and do, m many of us in our classes, is we try to engage. We try to engage with, with the community. And, and so by the time that you graduate with a bachelor's of arts in, in English, um, you, you hopefully will have, you know, really um, gotten to know some people who aren't JMU students, you know? And, um, and, and that's, that's a really rewarding thing is, is, is just knowing that um, there's so many different voices, you know? They may not all be equally accessible, but they're there and there are lots of volunteer opportunities and there are a lot of a lot of kind of cultural and political organizations locally um and it's also just a very friendly city it's, it, that's it's nick harrisonburg's nickname is the friendly city and people are quite friendly and when you get sick of people you can just get in your car drive for 20 minutes you're in the wilderness and you can take out your notebook and look at a mushroom. We're <laughs> <laughs> going to hike, whatever. Also, I want to plug like volunteering opportunities in student organizations. Like that's a big way that I've gotten out into the community um, and I love it. Um, so I'm in SGA, which is a student government association. And like every December we go to a local elementary school, which does the, uh, a program where like low income children can buy um, Christmas presents with like tickets that they've earned for good behavior. And then we help them pick them out and wrap them every single year. And like, that's been so special. And like, I love coming back and like seeing the kids grow up. Um, we unfortunately, did, oh, we're not dating this. Um, uh, we didn't get to go this year, but uh, I, I hope that carries on. And like, I love being out in the community. I'd like to just echo really quickly some of the points that everybody else has already made. Um, I have come from quite a variety of really big city urban environments, um, Taipei, San Francisco, LA, New York City, and um, all of those places are extremely diverse in all sorts of different kinds of ways. And um, I really want to build on Greg's point that even though I've been living in all those spaces, I don't find Harrisonburg or the surrounding region uh, to be any less diverse in many ways, it's just diverse in a different fashion. And the diversity is actually in some ways more practically accessible because everything is actually closer together. Okay, so when I was living in Los Angeles, we had so many enclaves, little neighborhoods and pockets that kind of people belonged in, but they look very close on the map. They were all in LA County, right? Or in the surrounding counties, but to get from point A to point B, you might think it only takes, you know, probably 15 minute drive. It usually takes two hours to get there <laughs> because of the traffic, right? And if you come from anything larger, right, city size, population size, you'll come down here and you'll think it's traffic heaven, basically, <laughs> right? Uh, that being said, I have encountered several um, longtime residents of Harrisonburg when I first moved here. Um, who I was talking to, and they said, do you know how bad the traffic is in downtown Harrisonburg? When I moved here from the countryside in the surrounding areas, we didn't have any traffic at all. And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> I guess everything's relative, right? But I find it to be really accessible in that way. So even if you don't have a car, you can really experience all sorts of things. And I think the term that keeps popping into my head is that um, this whole region is a collection of uh, what sociologists and literary scholars have called contact zones. They're places where different worldviews and belief systems meet and counter and clash, not in a violent manner, but in a manner that will really truly open up your ways of thinking, whether it's towards, you know, as Professor Ryan was talking about, the environmentalist imagination, or if it's towards a, a better appreciation of all the different needs of diverse communities as Professor Wren was, uh, Professor Fagan was talking about. Yeah, love living here. I would also just say that one thing that surprises me about some of the assignments that we engage in or the opportunities that JMU offers is that for even, even for local students, so if you're local um, and you think, 
you've got a pretty good handle on Harrisonburg. I think there's actually a lot to learn. There's a lot of um, places that open up to you, whether you're volunteering to serve a meal at the mosque or um, um, like Emily was talking about um, interviewing uh, a, a refugee from Syria or something like that, that you're gonna, you're gonna realize something new about this place that you've lived <laughs> maybe forever um, that, that you might not have seen uh, in the exact same way before. And I think that that's, that's valuable as well. I was going to say something and it flew <laughs> out of my head. Hmm. Well, I, uh, Emily, you had mentioned that you um, have been a, did you say a teaching assistant? Yes. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that experience or um, Ellis, if you have any like work outside of the English department experience you'd like to share. Uh, I think students might be interested to know other ways to be involved. Um, yeah, I would love to. So. Um, I'm the TA for Dr. Fagan's English 360 Ethnic American Literature class, um, and I actually really enjoy it. Like, it's a way to experience the class for a second time in a profoundly different way. Mm. Um, and so, like, I love that, like, I get to use, like, the things that I learned last year and apply them this year and, like, help the group create a better product. Um, and I know all the other TAs love it as well. Um, that's really all I've got, though. <laughs> and then, um... Over the summer, I was an orientation peer advisor, so an OPA. And um, the way I got that job was actually tied to Dr. White. Um, she like nominated me for it and things just escalated from there. Um, and I would say, especially within the English department, um, I'm really, I feel like I'm being a fanboy, but legitimately, you all are this great that um, they, the department does a good job of just presenting you opportunities and you just gotta find the, the courage to reach out and take it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I feel like that to a greater extent that even goes to like getting involved in jobs and things like that. Um, I feel like they're there and they're, I don't say easy, but cause things can get pretty stressful as a semester goes on, but, um, they're accessible. I feel like the department does a really good job of making opportunities accessible to their students. So, yeah. I would echo that too. Um, Dr. Fagan emailed me um, an internship that she thought I would like. And I was like, I would love that. Um, and it's so nice that like we have these one-on-one -on -one connections where like your professor actually knows you, knows your interests and like knows like what you wanna do in the future. I'm also a fangirl. Me too. <laughs> I was thinking about um, that the style of so many of our classes, the discussion style, workshop style classes, is that we get to know students really well pretty quickly because we're actually having regular conversations about interesting or challenging or difficult things. Um, and one of the things that I find most rewarding about being a faculty member um, is being able to get to know students and see this like this brilliance that they maybe don't see in themselves. And to be able to say like, you don't understand you are great and you're doing amazing things. And I know that it's hard, but like, you know, we can see things that, um, that it can be hard to see when you're in the middle of, you know, Wednesday doing your thing. Um, that's so rewarding. And that, uh, that I think faculty across the university would probably agree with that. That's one of the most rewarding things is to see students like light up on a morning when they're like, whoa, I didn't understand that. And now suddenly I do. And, um, and I, I, I'm aware of the fact that, um, that, there might be students in the audience who um, who are maybe undeclared or have expressed an interest in English but aren't sure. And I just wanted to say that um, uh, apart from the intro to the major, all of our classes are open to non-majors. Um, Professor Lowe was talking about the fact that some classes are uh, cross-listed between departments. So um, a person who's studying media, arts, and design, or a person who's studying English, they can both be in the class and get credit for their majors. There are all kinds of classes like that and cross-listing like that. Um, but also the door is open. So if you take a general education class and you think, I'm going to go ahead and be a computer science major, but I really, really want to take another class or a smaller class or an upper division class, that's possible in the English department. Um, and so uh, 
if you're a first year uh, and you really don't know what you want to study for sure, you aren't ready to declare a major or minor or two minors, um, you can come take an English class um, and, and you can learn and absorb without having to make the decision for the rest of your college career. Um, so I wanted to point that out because I think it can take some of the pressure off um, to know yet whether you're going to be a fanboy or a fangirl. Um, I'm literally an English major because of every reason you just specified. Um, so I took a general education class freshman year. It was um, it was like survey of American literature from 1860 to now. Um, and I did not expect to like it because I absolutely hated every single English class I took in high school. And I was like really, really dreading it. I was just like, let's get it out of the way. Um, and my professor, Dr. Hefner, reached out to me at the end of the spring semester. And he was like, hey, I really think you should consider an English major. And I was like, no. Um, I was like, it's going to be a firm no. Like, I don't want to be an English teacher. Um, and I ended up going to his office hours. Um, he obviously won, as we can tell. Um, but he, like, told me, like, explained to me, like, what the English major is and, like, how it can apply. And I was like, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so I ended up taking the one English major gateway class. And I was like, I'm an English major now. <laughs> um, and so, like, faculty, like, will reach out to you. Like, and it's so nice and, like, so rewarding to, like, know your professors. Um, and it's really changed my college experience for the better. And I'm going to echo that as well. Like, um, it's no secret because I feel like I've told Dr. Lowe and Dr. White this story, but like um, my second year here before I took a gap year, I literally had a 1.9 GPA. That was, that was my GPA. Uh, and then once I came into the English major and I found my sense of community, completely changed. Um, so like, yeah, I, I, I'm really indebted to the English major because quite literally I would have failed out of college <laughs> had I not discovered it. So um, yeah, I can't say what, like Emily just took the words right out of my mouth, um, so. We win you over. <laughs> We're persistent, well, if nothing else. <laughs> that's right. Uh, we've got about five minutes left in the session, and um, I think it's been wonderful. And I wondered if I could just ask us to kind of go around and um, if anyone would like to say uh, a few parting thoughts or a small piece of advice, um, we'd love to have them. Professor Wren, would you like to start? Absolutely. So the thing that's coming to mind um, you know, after listening to Ellis and Emily speak, um, I'm just, I'm remembering just this incredible experience I had having an intern, right? So we have an incredible, there may have been some allusions to it um, during our talk, but I just want to say a little bit more about it. We have an internship program in the English department and I had an incredible um, intern. She applied, I accepted her. She, um, she, she had been in actually one of my um, poetry writing classes <clears throat> and she was just incredible. She helped me write my memoir. She would, um, she, she did, she looked at research on, uh, you know, different cultures in the Amazon for me. She did a lot of research on trauma for me. She did a lot of research on climate change for me. Um, sometimes I would even show her some of what I was working on, um, some, some chapters. And we developed just an incredible um, partnership. And I know that she got an, an extraordinary amount out of it. And now she's one of our master's students here at JMU, English. Um, I know she got an awful lot out of it. Um, and she's considering perhaps um, a career in publishing. And I also mentored her about, you know, being in academia. And so there was, you know, she, she got a lot out of it, but I got a lot out of it because not only did, I mean, I, I developed just a very, just a very close relationship with her, personal and intellectual. And it, it was just, it's just one of those standout um, 
experiences, you know, that, that I had with the students. So um, I encourage everyone to think about this internship, internship program because you can, you can be doing some incredible things in archives for your professors as they work on their research. And um, it's just, it's, an, it's, it's something that, you know, it's like one of those, Alice was saying, it's one of those opportunities you really have to, to reach for, you've got to apply for it, but, but it, it could really be um, a game changer for you. So just want to plug the internship program and just say how much I enjoy. I love teaching here, love being here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lowe, a parting shot? Oh, you're muted. Thank you. The medium is literally providing no messages if I'm muted. <laughs> um, I feel like the department to me is like a big family, a functional family, not a dysfunctional one. <laughs> there are those. <laughs> um, and I'm going to date this, but only because it's such a good example of this at work. When I was teaching my eco cinemas class, I had a similar kind of experience as Professor Wren had, not in the sense that my students were doing research I was working on at the time together with me, but because they helped me to get through, you know, um, a difficult period in the semester. So we were in the middle of the semester when uh, a pretty unprecedented crisis hit the pandemic, COVID-19. And we suddenly had to switch gears and change our documentary projects. And it became impossible for a lot of people to actually work physically face-to-face -face in teams. They lost a lot of opportunities to do interviews, um, to actually go and talk to the people they had set up interviews for. Um, and I had some students, I redesigned the class, right, so that it would become possible for them to continue to flesh out their ideas, but perhaps not in the original forms. Now, some took that right opportunity and created some very personal works, some created some very ambitious works that didn't involve teamwork, but Ellis here, uh, he produced something altogether that was quite um, amazing, actually. It was uh, poetic, it was personal, and it was reflecting on the moment of transition itself, right? And I felt that this is exactly kind of what characterizes not just Ellis, but the spirit of the English department too, the students here. They're not here just to get a degree. They're not just here because they're undecided. Uh, they're not just because here just because they have a career in mind, but they are here because they realize that this is a department that um, encourages people to be mindful, to be in the present, and to reflect on everything that they do in a way that creates deeper meanings, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. And I found myself really inspired by students like Ellis, who really put forth not only their own creativity and sort of intellectual rigor into their work, but also their heart into it as well, too. So I, I think the English department is, um, is a place with a generosity of spirit and of mind, of course. Um, and so we would love to have you here, you know, the more the merrier, right? <laughs> Thank you. Professor Fagan? Oh, I'm, I'm also now feeling like I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> that was really lovely. Um, I was just thinking a little bit about some of like the key words that have come up over and over again in the past hour, you know, community and collaboration, generosity. And I think that that alone speaks for the kind of department that we are. We don't really ever see, um, you know, I think sometimes maybe we think about like, obviously reading as a very independent and individual endeavor. It's you and the book, but it's never just you and the book. Um, and, um, and I think that that can be in moments where we're feeling very isolated for whatever reason, um, culturally, socially, <laughs> geographically, um, that that a place like the English department is is um, it gives us an opportunity to remind ourselves of the ways that we're not alone. Whether we're connecting with other people in the classroom or a character in a book, um, and and yeah, I think. That sense of isolation is on my mind lately, but <laughs> but um, but there's so much joy in the togetherness of, of a department like ours. And I'll just echo Professor Lowe, we'd love to have you here. 
Thank you. Emily, any last thing you'd like to say? Yeah, um, this is so hard to answer, but like my advice to incoming students would be to understand that college is a very fluid experience. Um, just like go with it, like find what you like and run with it. Um, I almost dropped out after freshman year. Um, I hated it. Um, but then I decided to lean into it and like I became Miss Madison this fall. Change your major if you don't like it. Like you're not tied to it. Change your major to English. Um, join like join a club. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Run for leadership positions. Get involved. I feel like I've grown so much there, like just as in the classroom. Um, and like in the English department, like be curious, express gratitude. Um, like don't be afraid to bring in what you're interested to the discussion. Um, and just make the absolute most out of your JMU experience. And also it's okay if you cry in office hours. 100%. We are human, first and foremost. Ellis? Yeah, um, yeah thank you, Dr. Lowe, for being so nice. Um, I, I would say that kind of similar to what Emily said, my first few years here were just rough. And um, JMU English, like, really just gave me a place to be present, you know, and like be within the moment and be within my college experience. Um, so I would say like, if you have an interest in literature or film or just uh, things that maybe aren't STEM related, uh, I feel like just <laughs> English is just a place, um, especially the English department at JMU, I can't stress enough how amazing the faculty are, like legitimately, um, here's JMU, like Harvard, somewhere down here with you all. Uh, I'm being legitimate. legitimate. So um, yeah, uh, I would say if you're looking for a place to be, JMU English is it, so. Thank you. Um, I guess the last thing I would say, uh, well, echoes that this, um, there's a sense here that, um, that people could be who they are, ask questions safely, uh, find answers for themselves. Um, and what I would say, especially for um, a beginning student and maybe their families, is that uh, you don't have to come here already worked out with who you are, what you want, what you care about, and what you're going to be, <laughs> what you're going to do after college. Um, so much of the importance of uh, higher education, I think, is about increasing discovery and growth. Um, and so to think that we necessarily would come here knowing who and how we already are, um, I think that hasn't matched my experience, my personal experience in my own education and also working with lots of students. Um, so I'd encourage you, this is a, a swinging back to Professor Wren's conversation about openness. Um, a little practical thing is that uh, you can find us very easily uh, at jmu.edu slash English, or you can Google JMU English. Uh, we are, we faculty are listed um, under our people. Um, and I know that any of us would be very happy to have you reach out and ask any questions that you might have. Um, and if you are at some stage able to come to campus, uh, contact the English department and make could uh, we arrange to have somebody meet with you. Um, so anyway, I'd also like to thank the panel. I'm so grateful to you all for giving time, uh, for being able and willing to talk about your experiences. And um, I think that's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>